Well, good morning to you again. Uh, we're nearly done looking at Luke's transfiguration account in chapter 9. Uh, we've seen Jesus in Shekinah glory. We've seen Elijah and Moses turn up and discuss the second exodus to be reenacted at Jerusalem. We've seen Peter, James and John weak with a start to witness this incredible spectacle. How the disciples knew the two men were Moses and Elijah, we don't know. Maybe Jesus told them on the way back down. But they seem to come to, towards the end of the conversation, just as the two men are turning to leave. And my guess is that Peter's eyes are popping out, I and mean, wouldn't yours? And true to form, he can't just say nothing, so he blurts out, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And Luke adds, telling me, he did not know what he was saying. Well, we'll never know quite what was going on in Peter's head at that moment. And for sure, he figured it was momentous and perhaps appropriate to memorialise the site. But makeshift booths made from altered ends of wood wouldn't have lasted five minutes. And I suspect Peter had in mind Zechariah chapter 14, which predicts that at the end of days, people will come from all over the world to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So he's actually making a link to the end times. However, he hasn't just got his timing wrong. He hasn't merely got the wrong place because it would be Jerusalem. And he's suggesting three tabernacles for Jesus, Elijah and Moses implying that all three of them are equals on the same level. They aren't. Jesus is the pinnacle, the Son of God. Moses and Elijah are there to serve him. And within days of Peter twigging that Jesus is the promised Messiah, Peter still has not pieced it all together. Not yet, anyway. However, he hasn't even finished his sentence when God interrupts his well-intentioned blah because they are all enveloped in, by a bright cloud and overhead a new voice joins the conversation. This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The same voice that authenticated Jesus at his baptism now authenticates him again just before his last fateful journey to Jerusalem. Just for comparison, the voice at Jesus' baptism declared, You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Do you notice how the voice addresses Jesus at his baptism, but here at the mountain, the voice addresses the disciples and adds an extra instruction. Listen to him. I don't know if you know, but for centuries, Orthodox Jews have worn a little box on their right wrist and on the forehead. And in that little box, a scripture is written out in tiny letters. It's Deuteronomy 6, 4. It's known as the Shema. After the first word of that verse, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's considered a fundamental doctrinal statement. But it's this word, Shema, that the voice is invoking. Because to hear is to obey in biblical terms, in one ear and out the other, is not enough. Well, here's the musing, and it's a tough one. I find it so anyway. Are you listening hard enough to Jesus with a view to obeying him? Much grace and peace to you 
tomorrow we're coming back down the mountain and leaving the Mount of Transfiguration behind. Thank you.